All right, great. Thanks, everybody. Sorry, sorry to be uh, disruptive. So today we really we're really grateful and thankful for Di to present on data quality. Um, she runs a fantastic data quality course. So if any of you would like to attend, I know we've certainly from Damas and Africa point of view, we just review the training in terms of does it help people achieve the certification? And we certainly believe it does. So, Dai, thanks for that course and thanks for all the help that you provide. So, Dai, uh, before we hand over, I just wanted to share with you the upcoming event. So, our big data and data science is on Monday, the 20th of September. Um, and we really got an exciting speaker this, this time. He's a Dr. Don Steenkamp. I worked with him, I worked with him at the Reserve Bank. Um, and he's the lead economic researcher, and his title is a, an econometrician. And it's actually someone who can build the models mathematically and, and apply all the mathematical work as well. So he doesn't just run the models, he actually creates the math, mathematics to, to perform the analysis. So he's done some fantastic work. We've been working with him to establish data management within his department. So that's, we're quite excited for that. We will be shortly pronounced, uh, as soon as Di is finished with this, we'll announce the, the topic for the next month. We do have um, some feedback from Doug Laney, who said that he'd be interested in talking on uh, monetizing data products, uh, that infonomics that he, that he spoke, that he shared about. And then on Monday, the 4th of October, for the ins and outs of data modeling, we have Marita from Peru, and she's going to be uh, talking about from IT models to business models. Uh, just a reminder, uh, CDMP Q&A. So whatever questions you have about the CDMP certification, you can attend on Friday. Veronica presents that on Friday. Please note that that's, it's not, you're not actually going to be doing questions and answers for the CDMP. This is how, what the, how does the CDMP goes and just resolving some of the confusion around the CDMP exams, the certifications, and how to go about it, and some of the tricks that she's got. And then we've got career pathing for data management professionals. That's the African data management community. That's tomorrow at four o'clock. And we will be talking about um, for data citizens, and the title is Expecting Trust. So how do you define what your expectations are for trustworthy data? Okay. so. Dai, we'd like to hand over to you. Thank you very much for preparing and presenting. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Howard. Um, okay. Ah, here we go. Yeah, I hope you're not seeing my presenter notes. No, yeah. no. It just says Howard is a very weird person at the bottom. Of it. Oh, he sure is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank no. you, Howard. And thank you, Dama SA, for inviting me to participate in these workshops. So, you, you know, you all know I'm a, a data geek. I'm a data management professional, and I've recently been called a data diva uh -huh. when I sat on the panel. So today I'd like to talk about data quality, but not just about data quality. It's about data quality as a means to the end that we actually want to achieve. So what does a means to an end actually mean? It's the way to reach a goal or the way to achieve something. And that's the important thing. What do we actually want to achieve from a business perspective? And it's not always just data quality. So I've got a little story to tell and I'll start with a little bit about the company I work for and, and, and me. And then we'll go into data quality 101. And then data quality in the context of data management, which is more about what we actually want to achieve. And then linking it back to data quality as a means to an end in terms of the business objectives. And then what about you, you the data management professional and your career? What is the means to your end? So, Info Blueprint, we are a company 
dedicated to data solutions and information. So we don't sell tools, we provide services to help you in your data management initiatives and focusing on a couple of, of areas. So data quality, obviously, data governance, because that's the overarching bit, master data management, data engineering and migration, which is really about those other two pieces of the Dharma Dimbok wheel, um, data integration and interoperability, and uh, business intelligence and data warehousing. And just a little bit about me. Well, my name is Di, and I live in Edinburgh in Scotland, although I was in South Africa for 55 years. So I've been working remotely for the last four years. And believe it or not, I started my IT career. Yeah, you will believe it. Uh, way back in 1968. So 53 years ago at Leo Computer Bureau in Johannesburg. And I've tried to retire, but quite frankly, I've got such a lot to discover, such a lot still to learn, and, and maybe more important, such a lot to give back to the community that has served me so well. And here are some of my personal gurus, and you can see they're mostly all old guys. So I've got John Zachman up there, the father of enterprise architecture, Joseph Duran, Stephen Covey, uh, Bob Siner, non-invasive data governance, Donna Burbank, and one you might not recognize, um, Jim Harris, the obsessive compulsive data quality guy. And I'll, I'll try and show you through my presentation uh, how they've influenced me and uh, what they've given to my career. So a little bit about Data Quality 101. And this is the stuff that all of you guys know everything about. So let's talk first about the types of data that we're talking about when we're talking data quality management and the bigger picture data management. It's, it's structured, it's semi-structured and it's unstructured and it may be stored uh, electronically or on paper, non-electronically. And this is a picture I like to put up of uh, kind of what data means to me in terms of the structured stuff. So structured, um, I, I, I think about the transactional data and the master data. So transactional, that stuff, which is the invoices, the payments, the statements, uh, the events that occur in the organization. And they're mostly, or they always are, related in some way to this thing called master data, which gives the context to the transactional data, telling us the, the what, the, uh, the, the who, the where, so the people, uh, the products, and the locations. Yeah. And master data, I typically, or we typically, differentiate characteristic and reference. So characteristic being that a uh, product, person, and location, and the reference data being the classification data. So the lookup lists. I always think uh, way back to my days, 1980s, transactional data was always, and, and maybe you, you're not familiar with this term, date effective. So it was, something that happened at a point in time. So an invoice, an order, a payment, a, a bank transfer, and master data or characteristic was always period effective. So effective 
from a start date to an end date. And of course, there's this wonderful stuff called metadata, which gives context uh, to our uh, structured data, if you like. And let's have a, another little look at the metadata. Metadata inspired by one of my gurus, John Zachman. So what, how, where, who, when, and why. And inspired a little by Donna Burbank, who kind of took the John Zachman framework, the what, 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 how, where, who, when, and why, and said, let's classify our metadata in this way. So the what, what's the business definition of this data element? The why, why is this a critical a data element? What are the compliance requirements? The who, who is accountable? So uh, Zachman and Donna Burbank and many of the other gurus have kind of used this representation, but it, it really gives, for me, an, uh, an understanding of how complex this metadata stuff actually is. Okay, and what about this other thing that I missed out, the, the big data? And you know, uh, uh, when, when I grew up in IT, way back in 1968, 53 years ago, all we had was text and numbers. So big, big data, uh, video clips, audio clips, all of the stuff that we get from social media was unheard of. Uh, so all we had was thing, we didn't even have databases. We had a sequential access method, we had index sequential and we had virtual sequential VSAM. And today we've got all of this wonderful stuff and we're calling it big data and we've got all of these Vs. So big data characterized by a volume, a velocity, the variety of it, uh, the viscosity, how sticky it is, the veracity, and uh, they're adding these all the time, uh, the value of it. How are we going to visualize all of this wonderful uh, big data? And of course, we've got the metadata associated with that as well. So just carrying on with our data quality 101, if you think about the data life cycle, it's very similar to the HR life cycle. Yeah, we're, we, they plan to employ us and then they recruit us and they, they use us and we maintain, we're maintained and eventually we're archived or we retire and so on. So it's a complex life cycle, the life cycle of data and it defines the stages that we go through. So plan, create, we maintain and use, and underpin in that we store, we might encrypt the data, and we share the data. Eventually we archive and destroy, and underpinning all of that, we protect and secure the data. So a little bit about uh, the security aspect of our uh, Dharma Dimbok wheel. And you'll find many representations of the data life cycle. As you will find many representations of our data quality process. So how, how do we go about improving the quality of data if that's the end product? So scoping, profiling or assessing, getting out the, the real requirements, measuring, correcting, and the, the wonderful step, the implementation of preventative activities. And just a little bit more detail because 
the devil is in the detail in data quality management. So what are we doing in scoping? Uh, we're, and I feel like I'm, I, I don't want to be kind of preaching to the converted. You guys know all of this. So scoping, we're understanding what are our business objectives and what are the business risks around this data? And what are the benefits if the quality of this data is improved? Understanding our stakeholders and planning how we're going to go about a whole data quality improvement. I'm not going to go through all of the detail. Correcting the data is quite exciting. We somehow have to get the correct values, um, approve our data correction, correct the data, verify and report. And probably the most exciting for me is the preventative stuff. So uh, root cause analysis and looking at other methods of identifying preventative options. And what about return on investment or the payback uh, period? Implementing the preventative options and measuring how well we've done and then reporting back. So all about data quality improvement. So following our, our plan do check act. And uh, some more stuff that all of you guys know, uh, the data quality dimensions. So what is it? It's a term that we use to describe a data quality measure or a principle to which data should comply or a characteristic. So the criteria against in that previous process, we do the assessment and the measurement and the monitoring of data quality. And of course, these data quality dimensions, it's a many to many relationship between them and the data elements and the data entities and the data relationships data model. And I'm sure you're all familiar with this term. And these are obviously just some of them and there are a whole host of them defined in uh, the Dharma Dimbok, the big book. I'd like to uh, just uh, talk about a couple of them, maybe integrity and timeliness and reasonability, because these are kind of the ones that interest me quite a lot. Uh, so integrity for me has always been about referential integrity. So a link to database uh, data modeling and the data model. And what it's about is a measure of that consistency between the data objects in our database. So all required parts of the data are available. And what does this refer to? Every part of the data. And how do we measure it? Uh, we have uh, no orphans. Timeliness is one that sometimes kind of gets confused a little bit with currency or how up to date is the data, but it's about currency as well. So it's about how up to date is the data, but it's also about the availability of this data effectiveness of the data. So we have to consider uh, timeliness uh, within the concept of how fast the da data changes, so the volatility. And I, I always think of it in terms of things like exchange rate, the interest rate, stock exchange prices, so things that might affect banking institutions and the Johannesburg, the stock exchanges. So the latest version is required as and when it's the latest version is is available as and when it's required. So, you know, if we do a monetary, uh, an exchange of money, 
you, you want to know that the exchange rate you're getting is the, the exchange rate as, as of this moment. Reasonability is another exciting one because it's about the, the, the value of the data being acceptable. So what times, types of data is this applicable to you? And all sorts, but just for example, is an electricity bill of 22,000 Rand um, acceptable for a three bedroomed house? And is the age of 145 uh, um, reasonable and acceptable for a banking client? So how do we measure this stuff? The data falls between other uh, limits. Another obvious thing in, in, in um, data quality that we study when we do our exam are statistics and, and techniques. And here, just a couple of them. So count sum, min, max, range, mean, median, uh, mode, outliers, and then some more complex things, probability, variance, statistically, a valid sample and if you're studying for the data quality exam you better know all of this stuff so just some of the values the count is 11 the sum is uh, 1,874,000 and just some of the other values um, um, highlighted but just some of the other techniques that you want to be thinking about, if you're thinking about your data quality specialist, root cause analysis, Six Sigma, Perita, Kaizen, AND, activity network diagrams, FMEA, and statistical process control. I like to tell this little story about root cause analysis because it takes me back about probably 15 years. So if we start at the right hand side, we see the effect of someone slipping in a puddle of water and falling down and breaking their leg and suing us because they're in the foyer of our corporate building. So we take a step back and we look, wow, we've got a big puddle of water. And the puddle of water is the data defects. So we, what do we do? We mop up the puddle of water. And the next day we mop it up again. And the next day we mop it up again. And so we continually mop up or correct the data defects. So we look back a step and we see, what do we have? A dripping tap. So the dripping tap is causing the puddle of water. So that's the cause, and we take a step back again, and we say, why is the tap dripping? And we continually ask the question why, and we normally refer to the five whys, um, until we find, well, perhaps we've got a broken washer. And then we can ask the question, why do we have a broken washer? Yeah. And then we have a six sigma, so minimal number of defects. The Pareto uh, principle, which you probably know colloquially as the 80-20. So 80% of the effects um, coming from 20% of the causes. So that's the one we want to tackle. And then we have Kaizen. And Kaizen, um, kind of around, coming from Japan, making small changes to improve um, uh, quality and improve um, uh, process efficiency. ANDs, FMEA, and statistical uh, process control. And uh, uh, one of my, my gurus, I mentioned uh, Joseph Duran. So, contributed to um, obviously the Pareto principle, but also Six Sigma. So a great contributor to 
of process improvement. And kind of finally to end up Data Quality 101, what is quality data? And we've seen so many definitions, fit for purpose, fit for purposes, fitness for use, fit for purposes of use, and perhaps fitness for the purpose of business use. So a little bit what, how and why, coming from obviously a, a John Zachman. So the how, how do we go about getting quality data? And we've got Duran, Joseph Duran, um, Duran's trilogy, planning, control and improvement. And then side by that, we've got PDCA, so plan, do, check and act. And the DMAIC uh, approach coming from uh, Six Sigma. And, but maybe why? So again, Joseph Duran, one of my gurus, contributing to this area of my, my thinking. So why? The question is, why quality data? Yeah. So we're all out there promoting data quality, but that's not the end. Uh, what is the end? Um, and it's more to do with data quality in the context of what the business wants and what the business wants in terms of other aspects of data management. So just a reminder about the data life cycle, planning all the way through protecting and uh, uh, to destroy and underpinned by protecting. So managing the data life cycle affects all aspects of our Dharma deep uh, Timbok wheel. And the life cycle is a kind of a piece of glue that connects all these aspects of, of data management. So if we look at our framework, data quality is not there all by itself. There are 11 knowledge areas and data quality is impacted by all 11 and data quality must be considered in all, all other knowledge areas. So I'd like to uh, just suggest or present a different view uh, today of our Dharma Dimbok wheel, where I'm putting data quality in the center as the driving force, so it's not the end product, and data governance on the outside as the monitoring um, kind of mechanism, if you like. And I'd like to look at just a couple of segments or uh, pieces of the Dharma Dimbok wheel just to show that that's really where we're going. So if I look at reference and master data management or reference and master data or master data management, how does data quality influence MDM? And MDM is one of the things that the business requires. So it's one of the ends. So one of the principles might be we correct the data source. We make sure all of the transformation rules are defined. Aha, metadata. Ensure the end-to-end -end auditability of the process, a little link to governance. We integrate into MDM the data quality processes. So MDM is uh, data quality is part of MDM. And we ensure data lifecycle, data lineage, and we ensure processes are monitored. So we integrate all the data management disciplines into reference and master data management with data quality at the same time. And let's look at data integration and interoperability and what do we use that for? Well, that's kind of part of our data, in, uh, data migration a culture, we use data integration for master data management, and we also use it for data warehousing 
and business intelligence. So it's again about ensuring data quality rules are defined or transformation, ensuring the end-to-end -end auditability so the governance, life cycle and data lineage, security and privacy, and metadata. So we're integrating every single aspect of the Dharma Dimbok wheel into data integration, and we're mm -hmm. underpinning it with data quality. Data warehouse and BI, I guess much of the same. So data rules, transformation rules, auditability, data life cycle, data lineage, security and privacy. And what about the metadata a piece? So metadata is linking all of them together as well. We could put metadata in the center and we could put data governance on the outside and kind of tell the same story. So from a data quality perspective, what are we, uh, what are we about? We're about ensuring that the terms, the data terms are defined. So uh, just thinking about another guru who I haven't even mentioned, Ronald Ross, the data quality rules, transformation rules, and so on. And ensuring that other level of metadata, our measurement results, our correction results, and our audit trails are defined, and then wrapping it all together with ensuring the monitoring and control with data governance on the outside. So data lineage, again, about uh, what, how, where, who, when, and why. So going back to my uh, John Zachman and his framework for enterprise architecture. So it's more understanding, more context, and more metadata, ensuring uh, data quality. Just to uh, kind of almost finish up um, this little section on data governance. So what has data governance got to do with ensuring our data quality, ensuring that the, the policies are in place? The, so the, the, the stuff, the uh, policies, the processes, and then the people, the, the data owners and the data stewards, uh, the strategy, the monitoring, um, and the appropriate metadata, and the big one, and communicate, 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 and probably educate, educate, and educate. So data governance should ensure sustainability of our data quality efforts. And that's a bit inspired by uh, uh, Bob Siner and, and Stephen, Stephen Colby. And you know, from a data quality perspective, there's still a whole load of other stuff uh, to think about, uh, just a, a, a few of the bits and pieces. So we, we looked at Data Quality 101, kind of standalone, and then Data Quality in the context of some of the other aspects of the data management, the data management framework, so MDM, data integration, and so on. But let's just look back at, I said I wanted to talk about data quality, the means to the end. So what do our organizations actually want, uh, want to achieve? So if I think about it in terms of, of, of framework and business drivers, they want more money and they want to reduce the costs. And uh, these are common in probably many of your organizations. And what are their objectives then? What do they want to achieve? Sales, customer retention, uh, productivity, improved decision making, that one sounds good, reduced time to market and uh, compliance. So who asks for data quality? Which of your business executives say, I want data quality? 
in my organization. And there are not very many, but there's nobody does. Yeah. So uh, what do we really want to achieve? And it, it's about what the business wants to achieve. So it might be an improved customer experience, analytics, a 360 degree view of the customer, flexibility, ability to change governance, ability to adapt to new technology. So they're not asking for data quality. They're not asking for data quality, but how do we relate the, these things that they're asking for and, and see that data quality will underpin? So some of the other challenges that we're facing, increasing volumes of data, the lack of knowledge about the data, increasing requirements from uh, legislation, changing, ever-changing uh, business requirements, and we want sustainability. And then there are these other techie kind of, kind of things. I wish I, I had another 10 years to get to grips with AI, um, and machine learning, and, and big data. But what about poor data quality? Um, so where does this leave us? Yeah, I I would be. Yeah, I I couldn't leave out COVID nineteen because it's taught us uh, quite a lot of stuff and it's in, introduced or reminded us of some new terminology. So uh, during the pandemic, uh, we've been faced with an infodemic, so an abundance of information. And some of that information has been misinformation and disinformation. And what we're about as data management specialists is information. So we've got to protect ourselves from uh, this uh, misinformation and disinformation. And what's the difference between the two? Misinformation is a mistake and disinformation is intentional. So just to kind of indicate where we might address this is through data ethics. So not a, a, set, a, a piece of the wheel, but um, a, certainly part of, of Dharma Dimbok. So influencing principles of behavior based on what is right and what is wrong, uh, data ethics. This is something that I often like to share in my workshops. It's, um, it's a lithograph by Escher, and it's, it's called Relativity. And it's used by a guy called um, Jim Harris, likes to talk about this lithograph. It always reminds me of the Harry Potter movie with staircases moving and doors opening and closing and moving. So what it's saying is data quality is, is kind of, it depends on your perspective. So this is a, the fit for purpose thing. So we've got people going up and down stairs and you can kind of turn your head around and, and see how they're moving. And what Jim Harris, the obsessive compulsive data quality geek says is, a challenge for the data provider perspective on data quality, it's difficult to make a business case on the basis of trusted data without directions, connections to specific business needs. So data quality is not the end. We have to connect it to what the business actually uh, wants. And what Jim Harris also says in different words is he talks about data quality or data myopia. And it's about um, what he says is there's a digital difference between uh, the database and the real world. And if you try and keep the two in line, 
that's not enough. So real world alignment to the database does not guarantee business world alignment. What we really want to do is use data quality to achieve our business objectives at whatever they might be. And this is uh, one of my other gurus, uh, Jim Harris. So it takes me to the, uh, we've kind of done a little bit of what and why and who uh, and how. Uh, what about you? You, the data management uh, practitioners, where are you actually going and how is your career evolving? Uh, so Dhamma Dimbok is emerging as a standard and the Dhamma CDMP is becoming recognized as a certification, a standard. So just a little bit about the exams at the top left, where we start with our career is the data management fundamental exams, and that addresses all 11 knowledge areas on the Dharma Dimbok wheel. And in addition, the data management process, and big data and data ethics. And then your, your career or your growth in CDMP from an associate through to a fellow. And there are not very many fellows. The CDMP levels, so it just goes from associate, practitioner, master and fellow. But yeah, I have to tell you that um, COVID and lockdown has been quite good for me because at my age, I decided to write the exam uh, thanks to Veronica Diesel, uh, who encouraged me last year. So I I kind of wrote the I wrote two exams, the CDMP fundamentals and the data quality specialist. And I have to tell you, I was terrified because I had a failure. I had a, a fear of failing. And I, I thought, why am I afraid of failing? But I, I was. And anyway, I, I did the exam. I didn't do enough uh, preparation, but I, I did OK. I got a, a master in data quality and I got a practitioner, which is over 70. And, you know, there are no comments on the scorecard. However, it's encouraged me to do the exam again. Uh, so I'm going to do my fundamentals again after having attended Veronica's course. So I'm kind of committed to doing that. And you think, Di, why are you doing an exam? Uh, because I can and because I want to and because I want to grow my career. So where are you planning to focus? Yeah, where are you guys going? And you best think about it. So if you're thinking about it, data quality underpins everything. And I've said other, but you know what? I'm going to bite the bullet. Data quality underpins it all. Data governance oversees it all and data governance underpins. So data quality exam, these are it's just a breakdown of how the questions are distributed. A little bit about if you're interested in taking the exam, we do provide it. Uh, uh, the, sorry, we do provide uh, data quality, um, uh, this uh, course, a workshop, and Veronica reviewed it as education uh, director of Dharma SA. Yeah. Some of the things that we cover in the course, we cover the essential concepts, the activities and the techniques. So just to wrap up, it's a means to an end. So uh, what is what is your goal? Uh, where do you plan to go? What is your end product? And just some of the things you might ask yourself. So what parts of the SDLC are you interested in? Is it architecture or design or 
uh, modeling. What area of the business excites you? And maybe what are your strengths and skills? Where can you make a difference? And yeah, for me, it's about what is your passion? Where do you actually want to be? What is your strategic plan for yourself? And what will be at the means uh, to your end? And how are you going to get there? So that's about it, Howard. I'll just get out of that if I may. And if there are any questions, I'll, I'm here and I'll be happy. Hi, thank you very much. Um, really appreciate it. Uh, I really like the the way in which you've put data quality at the center and and then able to almost ask uh, how that is uh, implemented or related to in the other knowledge areas very and I, and I think your the most important point you made was that it's actually applicable to to all of them. So you could put metadata in the middle, you could put data architecture, you could put that and it's then interesting to see how it works its way into into the different areas. So thank you very much for sharing that. I, I, I really like that. Um, I, I've got a few questions that I've put in there, but I know that I uh, hopefully that others have questions. So let's open the floor to those. Um, and if you wouldn't mind op uh, putting up your hand and I'll, I'll try to uh, Ask Dai uh, in a in a sort of controlled fashion. Any any questions from the floor? Hey Howard, it's it's Mark here. I uh, thanks Dai for that. You give you've given me the courage to go write some more uh, CDMP exams. <laughs> <laughs> some motivation. Good. I'm in I'm in the same boat as Howard. I wrote the old V1 exam, and I got seventy nine percent, so one percent short of master. And now I need to start back at fundamentals. And um, even with even mastering the fundamentals really only gets you an associate until you write two more exams. So you really got to write three and that's a thousand dollar touch to me. Yeah. Um, you know, so is it a money grab or, you know, I'm not getting dumber yeah. since 2015. I'm learning more every day. Not <laughs> so a little frustrating. Yeah. Yeah. We've we have raised that. Um, yeah. We're in the same. Howard and I are in the same boat. With along with Dara O'Brien and and many other very smart people in the space of data management. So, any any other questions before we get down that hole? Um, okay, all right. So so, Di, I, I, if I wouldn't, if I can start with my questions, I did just to keep my mind uh, and stop myself from interrupting you. I noticed on one of the slides that you actually had root cause analysis after correcting the data, which um, which surprised me because almost what we, we spoke about is is one has to be careful of going to correct the data when when you actually don't understand what the root cause of the data is. So uh, I was interested in, in terms of why you positioned root cause analysis at the end. Yeah, Howard, that's a, a great question. I prefer to do prevention prior yeah. to correction. Of course I do. But very often the business requirement is that we fix the data. So very often you'll also find correction and prevention running side by side. Um, so sometimes it happens that way. I would always advocate you do it first. You stop the dripping tap before you mop up you, you before you fix the data. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Mm. OK, I see Mariani. Uh, Sigoya, you, you've got a question? Uh, yes. Uh, hi, Howard. Hi, Dai. Thank you so hi. much for. Thank you for the presentation. Just a question on the on the cleansing part. And it's how do we effectively identify the people that need to do that? considering that we've got technical and business in the process, but how do you ensure that as we, so you've identified it and then now we can see where it is, but how, like, I think more practically, how do you do that in order for us to start getting the data cleansed? All right, okay, so it's about the roles and responsibilities in the data correction process. So 
for me, first of all, you have to have a, a process defined. So this is how we're going to go about correcting data. Uh, for me, when I define a process, I define for each step the inputs, the outputs and the roles and the responsibilities. So you will have many roles involved in uh, correcting. You'll have some technical people, you'll have your data stewards uh, your, or your SMEs, you'll have your data owner possibly in approving the correction. So it's multiple roles and multiple roles involved in the steps. Does that help you in any way? Yes, it does. Um, it's just that I'm being faced with a challenge where like a data element is shared across and there's just a lot of bickering. Oh, OK. Yeah. Yeah, so, I think, uh, yeah, Mariani, that's a, it's a great question. That's certainly where governance comes in um, and ownership. And, and you've got to sort of try to get it back to the to the owner. OK, thank you. Yeah, and the, the problem, yeah, exactly. It's the owner's responsibility, but it's that sharing. Yeah. You have two owners, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So it, uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's as Di says, it, uh, there are many people that are involved in terms of doing the data fix. It may be uh, that we need developers or someone to do the data fix, but then if they can then fix where the problem starting, where the leaking tap is, uh, and then if there's processes that can be put in place by the owner or the steward, then all of those different areas. Mm. I had another question there. You you included a dimension that um, that called. Uh, let me just check. It's called the data format. Yes. And yes. and the consistency as well, which is sort of not not uh, common. Yeah. In, in that in that allocation. So I see you've differentiated between the two. Okay. When I talk about um, data type or data format, I'm talking about the kind of structure of the thing. So is it alpha? Is it numeric? Is it a date format? Is it DD stroke MM stroke YYYY? And when I talk about consistency, consistency is a, a, a check that I do across two or more data elements. So for example, we've got SAID number, gender and date of birth. So each one um, has its own rules to which it should comply, but there's a check that goes across all three that checks the that the date of birth is consistent with the first six digits of the SAID number. And the gender is consistent with that little middle chunk. The, the other place I do consistency checks is addresses. Um, so um, you've got um, address line one, address line two, we've got suburb, uh, we've got, sorry, street, maybe suburb, province, town, and postal code. Some of these attributes should be consistent with each other. So a, a suburb is has to be consistent with its postal code. Does that make sense? Yes, and I, yeah, I love this diagram from the book. Mm. I, 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 I mean, the, I think that's a really important thing that we understand when we, when we do dimensions, is that there's there's lots of inter interconnect connectivity between the dimensions. There's that last di last e element that I posted was you got that dimension uh, dimension and underlying concept and then the metric, and and it's always helpful to keep those three in mind. When, when we're trying to define, or when what we refer to as the data citizen is trying to define their, expect, their expectations of the quality. Yeah. Mm. Okay, yeah. fantastic. And uh, I know you, sorry, sorry, Di. I always think with things like addresses, so you've got maybe six different attributes, and yeah. each one might be good, but together yeah. they're not yeah. good. You know, yeah. it's, 
they've got to be good as a, a piece of usable information. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that, that's also sort of what I understand that logical consistency to be. Mm -hmm. And and I think that that's another area that, that I find people not always understanding is when we define the quality on that data set, we define, first of all, the rules at a column level, then the rules at a row level or multiple columns, and then the rules at a data set level. So there, there are quite a few aspects to that quality definition. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Drew, Drew, you had a question. I saw your hand go up. I'm not sure if you still got it. Yeah, I was going to comment on that uh, point about um, correction of the data and the root cause analysis. Um, because very often in, in doing the root cause analysis is where you may identify that one, you need to make a system change, for instance, to, to change the, the drop downs to ensure that the data is, is clean. You may need to change something from being optional to mandatory. But it's also there where you'd likely identify that uh, training is required, um, which is absolutely outside of the, the realms of, of a typical data quality person and falls very squarely into the, the responsibility of business. Yeah, Drew, I like the, um, I don't know if you've ever seen that breakdown of almost the types of data stewards where we have producing data stewards, defining data stewards and consuming yeah, data yeah. stewards. And then those those people that produce or those that look after the application and they get involved. That goes to Mariana's question of they would get involved in in rect or correcting the problem um, if it's a if it's something that we can affect at a at an application level. That's, yeah, that's correct. Yeah. I loved the the one time one experience that I had with one business where they were really battling with the procurement data and specifically the registration of vendors. And it was interesting, the very first thing they did was to say, guys, we know that this is going to take some time to build a master data thing, but the way we can fix it right now is to create a central area that would create the vendors so that they understood the relationships between the different vendors. And there wasn't people from finance creating it, people from procurement creating it, and then having all these different areas. So. Lots of times we find that business can can have a, a real simple solution to fix and, and deal with the root cause. So, so helpful to have all of the people involved in that discussion. Mm. Di, thank you very much. I don't know if there's any other question before we close, but really appreciate your time. Uh, thanks for that insight. It was it was fantastic. Great, you're welcome. Thank you. There you go. You're a rock star. I'm guy. a rock star. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. I'm with that. Mm. Yeah, I, can, I can second that. Well done, Di. Thank you. I'm a flower child, actually. I'm a hippie. Always happy. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks, everybody. Thank Thanks you for your time. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Bye, everyone.